Hey everybody, it's great to see you today. Welcome to Living Power, your online Bible study where we're walking through the Bible in a year. Today is March 17th, happy St. Patty's Day, and we are studying the book of Deuteronomy. I wanted to pull out just this little passage under the section of guidelines for a king that I just love. Now you have to remember, this this was given by, by God to Moses, and this is uh, in what's called the book of the law, Deuteronomy, and these guidelines for a king were written way before there was ever, ever any mention or thought of a king. So this is God again in his provision and in his providence looking forward to the time when Israel would have a king. Now in verse 18 it says when he sits as on the throne as king and then it gives some explanation and a warning as to what would be good and not so good to do. Um, in starting with verse 15, it says, make sure you, you have a king that God chooses. In verse 16, the king must not build large stables for himself. And it continues, the king must not have many wives. And it continues, the king must not accumulate large amounts of wealth, silver and gold. When we get to the time of David and his son Solomon, we want to we come back and remember this because... Solomon doesn't follow this, and in fact, he does the exact opposite of these three things. And when he ends up writing the book Ecclesiastes, he's like, well, this, this stuff's all meaningless. I've chased, chased after these things in my life, and I see now that they've come to nothing. So this will be important to remember when we get there. Let's start with verse 18, um, because I think we can apply this to our life, 18 to 20. It says, when he sits on the throne as king, number one, he must copy for himself this body of instruction on a scroll in the presence of the, the, the Levitical priests. Now back then, they didn't have notebook paper. They had scrolls, parchment paper, if you will, long scrolls. And I think they could get 2,000 characters on a scroll, and then they'd have to have to start another scroll. I think that's right because I think I heard at some point Luke, the book of Luke and Acts uh, is one story written by Luke but they had to cut off the scroll because there's a maximum amount of characters on a scroll so they ended up making it two books in two scrolls and that's how we have Luke and Acts. Just a little tidbit of trivia there but back to the back to Deuteronomy 17 when i read that i thought i thought to myself you know i don't really copy down i've never thought about copying down scripture so then i started googling and i realized there are people like just like you and me that do this and you can actually copy the whole book the whole bible in your lifetime i think there's like 119 par 1000 paragraphs of the bible i was thinking well if i copied one paragraph down a day how long would it take me? Well, that was too long. But if you could copy a chapter a day, you could do it in about four years. And if you if you copied, obviously, as much as we're reading, you could copy the whole Bible in a year. Now, I'm not saying we need to do that, but I wonder if there's any application in here for when we're studying a portion of Scripture. Would it not behoove us to then write down that portion of scripture that we're studying. I think that's something that I might start to try. Um, let's continue on with 19. So we have number one, he must copy the scroll. Number two, he must always keep it with him and read it daily as he lives. Do you keep this Bible with you when you're traveling, when, when you, um, when you, wherever you go, is it that important that you would keep it with you and read it daily? Hmm, very interesting. Then at verse 20, this regular reading will prevent him from becoming proud and acting as if he is above his fellow citizens. That's a problem for every person at some person in their life. It's just that whole thing of pride coming up, coming out of our hearts. You know, pride is a sin that God hates, and we know we need to be careful of it. And here, the Word is telling us that regular reading and staying in the Word of God will help prevent that. Isn't that a beautiful promise? And then it says it will also prevent him from turning away from these commands in the smallest way. Wow, you know, there's a psalm that says reading the Scripture 
can keep a person from sinning. Paul in the New Testament has said many times, stop sinning. Do you think it's possible? Well, here it says regular reading, being immersed in God's word on a regular basis can help a person to do that, to follow his commands and to be obedient to God. That is a beautiful promise, I think. So I've got five benefits to regular reading in the Bible just from this. Number one, we would learn the fear of the Lord. Number two, we would learn to obey. Number three, it would prevent us from becoming proud. Number four, it would prevent us from sin, even in the smallest way. I love that. And number five, it would ensure prosperity. And it says that at the end of verse 20, and it will ensure that he and his descendants will reign for many generations in Israel. So, you know, Jesus came to give us life, but he also came to give us life abundantly. And that is this whole part about having joy and prosperity. God desires to bless you and me in this moment, in this day, and he requires obedience from us. Um, for, on our part, and this is a way that we can stay in the will of God in doing that. So what I want to do now with the remaining part of our time is just cover, cover a little bit of summary for you. Some of this reading, the justice for the people, you know, the call to holy living, all that, you know, it's easy to get bogged down and be just kind of gloss over it and say, what in the world? What does this have? How does this apply to me? What does this have for me today? So I wanted to just let you know that there is something important that we need to understand about the judges. I'm probably back in Deuteronomy 16, verse 18, where the reading started today on March 17th. The judges were different from the priests. The priests came from the line of Levi. The judges were officials that were point, appointed out of any of the tribes. And they were to administer justice. This is where it's important. Do not take bribes. Do not show impartiality. And in one book I read, it said, do not recognize faces. When you are sitting on a board or making decisions that affect other people, do you show impartiality in those decisions? Don't recognize faces. I love that. Number two, judges were important because they were to ensure holy worship and that worship was being conducted as um, as right and appropriate. So they ensured that false worshipers were executed. <clears throat> they ensured the quality of the sacrifices that were being made uh, at the uh, tabernacle by the priests. And they were to ensure that there were no pagan practices going on. So ultimately, if the priests failed in their responsibility, responsibility to be absolutely true to all of these laws, the judges were the ones that had to intervene. Did you know that? You know, we read a lot about the priests, but there was a second level of accountability and authority here in God's plan to make sure all of these things were carried out the way God intended. So God is taking into account here the tendencies of human nature, and he has layers of accountability. I think this is important. Now, we saw other things, other references about two witnesses. And we've talked about that before. Two witnesses were to guard against people lying and bringing false witness against someone. And there was a part in the reading today about the two or three witnesses that spoke against a person in the court system were, if they were found guilty, to throw the first stone. Now, why would that be important? Well, if they were proved to be a liar later, that the witness that they had given against this person was false, then they would have been in a position of committing murder. And then they themselves would have, had, would have been stoned and had to, had to be, uh, be executed. So this was a sort of a double layer protection against falsehood and being, bringing falsehood against your neighbor. Now, there was something else I wanted to mention to you about um, the progression here as we're getting to a king. Now, there is a guideline for a king here, but we don't see anything in the life of Israel yet that says they're going to get a king. Now, if you've read through the Bible before, you know that the king is coming. But there was Moses, and then when Moses died, Joshua was raised up as a leader, and Joshua was with Moses 
for a long, long time being trained and being uh, tutored, if you will, to take over this role. Joshua was God's chosen successor after Moses. Then came the priests and the judges. They were the ones ruling after Joshua. Okay, then we're going to get to the point where there's a king in the life of Israel and the king would govern. So the judges and the priests, that whole system was supposed to work if the people followed the commandments of the Lord. Well, we'll see later that they didn't, and then they got into the monarchy and so forth. But let's talk about, in our last couple minutes here, the priests and the Levites. I want to just kind of give you a refresher, but I want to expound on something that we haven't talked about yet. The priests and the Levites were different. They all came from the tribe of Levi, which was one of Jacob's 12 sons. But there were three divisions, probably three sons of Levi, so there were three divisions in the, uh, in the tribe. So three families. We had the Gershonites, the um, uh, Kohathites, and the Merorites. Mer Merorites. I won't spell those for you. The Gershonites, the Merorites, and the, um, oh, I shouldn't have said them twice, the um, Kohathites. K-O-H-A-T-H-I-T-E-S. Anyway, the descendants of Aaron came from the line of Korah. Korathites is probably how you pronounce it. The descendants of Aaron came from the line of Korah, one of these three men. The descendants of Aaron were the priests. The only the priests could come from the descendants of Aaron. Remember, Aaron was Moses' brother. All of the other people that were descended from the tribe of Levi could be, were, were considered Levites, and they could be ministers before the Lord. Both were chosen, both of these Levites and the, the descendants of Aaron, all from the tribe of Levi, were called by God to be ministers unto the Lord. The Levites taught the law, assisted the priests, and the priests officiated at the tabernacle and the later temple, guarded the scroll, so they all had different duties. They were all very important, but they were very different. The New Testament, I know you love it when we, when we kind of connect the Old with the New Testament. The New Testament broadened the priesthood to include all Christians. You and I, even though we're not bloodline descendants, of the tribe of Levi are considered the priesthood because we are covered by the blood of Jesus. And this is coming from 1 Peter 2, 9, 2, 9. Why is this? Jesus superseded the Aaronic priesthood because he came from the line of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, back in the book of Genesis, was that priest and prophet that, uh, that Abraham met in Jerusalem, and he signified a priesthood that was eternal, that would never end. Jesus comes from a priesthood that will never end. He supernaturally is counted from the line of Melchizedek. And so Jesus has superseded the Aaronic priesthood, and he is of the eternal priesthood. So you see, here's the bottom line. Every Christian, you and me, has come into the family of Jesus and is a descendant of the priestly line because of what Jesus did in making us sons and daughters of God. We are now in the family of God, and we are considered a priest from the probably from the line of Melchizedek. That's where our spiritual heritage comes from, which is just really, really cool, I think. So, now that you know you are considered a priest, and now that we've read all the requirements of holy living in being, being a priest and ministering to the Lord, here's my question for you today. How are you living as a priest of the Lord? Do you know the word? Do you study the word of God? Do you take it seriously? Are you ministering to the Lord? Are you looking for ways that you can serve others? Giving of your time, your talents, your gifts, or your service. Have you joined a local church? Membership in a church is very, very important because going to church is not always about, it's not only about what we receive, but being in the body of Christ is always about 
receiving a personal relationship with Jesus and cultivating that relationship with Jesus so that God can then work through us in service to others. So you see, being a member of a church is not just what we receive, but it's what we can give to build up the body of Christ and how we allow God to work in us to be in service to others. A lot of responsibilities of the priesthood. It, we are called, Peter tells us, to be a holy nation and our lives to be lived out as living sacrifices. That is your destiny. That is your inheritance as a child of God. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the lesson today. We're going to continue in the book of De Deuteronomy tomorrow. I hope to see you then. Shalom.